You know, if I was to ask you this morning, let's take a little survey, if there was, what is the greatest city on the planet today? I think most people, Americans probably, not necessarily because we like it, but we would have to say New York City, I would, I would say. You know, one of the largest, one of the most multi-ethnic uh, and influential city. You think of other cities around the world, you think of Paris and Tokyo and Moscow and London, L.A., Shanghai, Beijing. During Paul's time, there, was, there wasn't any debate. There was one city, Rome. Rome was the city. Actually, it, the, you know what Rome's nickname is? The Eternal City. The Eternal City. And it's been estimated that people have lived there since the dawn of, of humanity. But it was formally established in 753 B.C. That's when they can go back the furthest and say, here's where it was formally declared a city. And by 200 B.C., it became the capital of the known world. The Roman Empire stretched from the, the edge of, of the Middle East all the way through Central Asia, all the way through Eastern Europe. I, I'm sure many of you are familiar that there were Romans in Britain. There's still Roman um, ruins in Britain today. During the time of Paul, Rome had an estimated population of about a million people. And it ebbed and flowed over time. But whenever you talk about where, where can I go to have the most impact? Where can I go to have the most influence? It would have been Rome. And because in the Roman culture, you know, new ideas and important messages were presented in a very particular way. They were heavily influenced. Rome was heavily influenced from the Greeks. They, they really admired the Greek culture and they adopted a lot of the same things that the Greeks loved. And, and so whenever it came to important messages uh, or new ideas, they come out in a very particular way. They, they, I mean, we, we have articulate, formal speeches before large crowds in large public arenas or forums that would be scattered throughout the city. And so for Paul, who has this new message of the Messiah, God's Son has come to this planet and died on our behalf, if, if he's going to use that and leverage that message and get it out to the most people, he knows he has to go to Rome. And so Rome is his ultimate goal. It's the, the Roman Empire. Rome is the epicenter. And so Paul, for Paul, he wanted to be in front of the crowds. He wanted to be one of those people that would stand before the multitudes and he would share the idea of the gospel. He wanted to, the, the word that we're going to see today is he wanted to advance the gospel. He, and, and so whenever we talk about advance the gospel, you have to think of it in terms of a military conquest or a military advancement. It, it's almost like when, when, a, when an army goes into a new area, when there's some expeditionary forces that go into a new, new territory, they send out uh, sort of some scouts, if you will. And they burst open and they make new ways. Those are sappers. And, and they open new avenues for the army to follow through. That's what Paul's idea here is as he begins to advance the gospel. I mean, and just think of the influence he could have. We're talking millions of people. If he could just get to Rome. So in his eyes, it's critically important that he makes it to Rome. And when he finally gets there, it's anything but what he expected it to be. He shows up not as a public orator, influencing thousands and thousands of people. He arrives in Rome as a prisoner. And his only audience is one guard. And so those thousands of crowds, they've been reduced to one guy. And it's that guard that he is what they call a short shackled. He was shackled by the wrist to this guard, and there was a short section of chain that, that connected him to that guard. And so this is really not how he anticipated spreading the gospel around the world. I mean, um, he didn't expect to be a prisoner. 
but he is. And he's in a secluded house, shackled to one guard, and these guards rotate. And so this is not his plan. Apparently, God has a different method in mind. And so here's the idea that we're going to start with, and then we'll build upon it. And that's this. Paul's circumstances has changed, but his message does not. His purpose remains the same as well. And that is this idea this morning that Christ must be central to your life. Number one, look at Romans chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to see just what a difference it makes when we keep Christ central in our lives. Look at verse 12. Philippians 1.12. He says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. So, as we've already noted, Paul's in prison. He's uncertain of when he'll be released or when he'll be prosecuted. He doesn't have any idea when that's going to be. Actually, it takes several years for this all to happen. But here's Paul. His attitude remains the same. And that's so, so here's the truth for us. Number one, when Christ is the center of your life, He changes our attitude towards our circumstances. I mean, let's be honest. My attitude, if I found myself in Paul's shoes, if I was chained, all I had wanted to do was be able to stand in front of crowds and preach about Jesus, tell people about Jesus. And all of that's been reduced to a home imprisonment with one guard. I mean, let's be honest. Our attitudes wouldn't be so optimistic. I mean, I don't know about you, but as I read that, I didn't hear him crying. I didn't hear him moaning, griping, and complaining about his circumstances. But if it was me, I would have been bitter. I would have been angry. I would have, there would have been some depression that had set in. I would have been upset within my soul. I would have been negative to everybody that come around me. I would have been resentful and hateful. You know, and let's just take, let's call a spade a spade. We have much less things happen to us and we act that way, don't we? You know, that's the result of looking at our circumstances from a human perspective. But Paul's attitude towards this hardship, he chooses a different approach. He, de he determines to look at the situation from God's perspective. He's determined not to let these circumstances dictate his attitude. That's Paul's idea here. And it's so important for us to, rather than looking at things through a human perspective, sometimes we need to just take a step back and look at it from God's perspective. Instead of asking, why has this happened to me? We ask that question quite a bit. Why have I found myself in this situation? Why has this happened to me? Why am I in this circumstance? Paul begins to ask this question, okay, how can God benefit from where I'm at and what I'm doing? How does this, how does all of this, this, this home imprisonment and this shackled, how does this benefit God's purpose? Paul's attitude has a little twinge of joyfulness to it, you know? There's no despondency. He, he's not saying, hey, feel bad for me. He's saying, hey, don't feel bad for me. He's saying what has happened is for the good and people are hearing the gospel. He knows that his temporary sufferings he's in, in having to endure are serving a greater purpose. And, and that is, number one, he's, get, he's received access to people he had never dreamed of ever having access to. The good news is reaching people that he only could dream about reaching. Yeah, it's one guard but it's one guard within the palace contingency. He, he has access to the imperial court here. And so in his mind, if, if I go to Rome and I'm preaching to the multitudes, I'm preaching to the common man. 
And I would have never thought that my message would have ever been in the imperial courts. But here I am, and I'm shackled, and, and I have access to the greatest, most honored of Caesar's guards. That's how he begins to look at the image. It's like, I've got a captive audience here. This guy can't get away from me. And so don't you know Paul just chewed his ear off? Just, just beat him down with the gospel, continually talking about Jesus' goodness. And so Paul here, he has access to Roman guards, and they're hearing about Jesus, and that's what he says. He says, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. The whole palace guard. Everybody, every time that, that guard changes, every three hours... He gets a new, new audience, someone new to hear his message. But he also realizes that his imprisonment is to the benefit of other Christians there in the, in the city of Rome. The Christians at this time are really not highly regarded. They're treated as second-class citizens, if you will. And so Christians just like him are facing persecution all over the Roman Empire. And, and as they look forward to their future, they're, they're fearful that what's happened to Paul may happen to them. And, and so that fear really kind of served to create silence with them. I mean, they didn't want to end up imprisoned either. They didn't want to have to face uh, the, the Roman court system. And so as, as the persecution begins to close in on them, they, they became silent. And the message of the gospel... Would have, would have just hit a wall. But Paul begins to recognize something greater that's happened. He says, because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence. And so Paul sees that his bravery while in prison and his, his willingness to begin to share with anybody that comes in his sphere of influence and his attitude that Christians everywhere are beginning to pick up on his attitude. And they're adopting that attitude, and it's encouraging them in their own faith. And so when Christians saw Paul in prison, they're reminded, hey, you can put up with more. You can endure this persecution. You should speak out. You should be vocal. If you're arrested, be brave. That's, Paul understands that people are watching me. My attitude is communicating to the greater Christian brotherhood and they see me and they're going to adopt that. And so if, if I get down in the mouth about it, everybody else is going to get down about mouth about it. You see, if you're a leader, you have to understand that people are watching you. And as a leader here, I have to be cognizant. I, I really have a tendency as a melancholy to kind of get down on myself and kind of see, see the glass as half empty. But whenever I do that, you guys pick up on it, right? And, and you begin to adopt that same attitude. And so I really have to check myself. I, I can't allow my circumstances to dictate my attitude. We have to remain joyful. We have to begin to see things through God's perspective and know that God's at, at work in a greater way. I mean, think about where we're at right now. We're, we're down by a third in here. And it would be easy for me just to wallow in the mud, in the muck, and, and, and just feel like a, a dog and, and that's being kicked. But you know, I, I have to believe that God has a greater purpose for, for this pandemic. And that there's, He's going to do something great amongst here. But if I allow everything that's happening in the midst of this pandemic just to weigh down on me, you'll pick it up and you'll feel the same way. Don't let that happen. You see, our sufferings, the things that we're going through, they're unpleasant, but it also gives us a platform for our very special message. So think about this in terms of your own life. Think about your battle with cancer. Yeah, the circumstances are terrible, but it gives you a platform to, to raise Jesus up and, and to maintain a joyful attitude in the midst of that suffering. Maybe, maybe you lose your job. Or maybe you, you and your wife or you and your husband have experienced a miscarriage. 
or, or maybe you, you've been involved in a terrible automobile accident. I mean, there's just, I could list thing after thing after thing about sufferings and, and valid sufferings that we have every reason, justified reason to get down on ourselves. But see, really, those sufferings are allowed to pass through God's hand into our life because it gives us a platform to speak about hope. The hope of Jesus. It gives me an opportunity to share good news with people who have never heard that good news before. In February of 2012, my father passed away. And I, during the time that we was meeting about the funeral preparation, I, I told them, I said, I am going to preach the funeral. And everybody's going, oh, you don't want to do that. You know, it's so emotional and you, you won't get through it. And I said, no, I want to preach this funeral because I know there will be people attending my father's funeral that have never heard the gospel. And I took that hardship and that suffering, and I'm not saying I'm a superhero at all, all right? But I just recognized the circumstances behind the situation. And I took that opportunity to share the good news with a room full of people who have never heard the good news of Jesus. Those of that had heard the good news of Jesus, they pretty much brushed it aside or, or classified it as insignificant. But when we have these sufferings and these unpleasant things that happen, and they may seem like a death blow in your life, like this is the worst thing that could ever happen. Actually, it, is it possible it may serve a, a, a different purpose? Maybe to you, it's unpleasant. You don't like your circumstances. But maybe it's given you a platform to share your faith, or to encourage someone else. That's what Paul is saying. I had the opportunity to share my faith with those Roman guards and all of the Roman court, and I had the opportunity to encourage other believers. You know, Paul, I think Paul just really kind of adopted Joseph's attitude. When Joseph was thrown into the cistern, and then he was sold off to the, the Ishmaelites, and then eventually makes his way to Egypt, and finds himself in prison there, and then ultimately he's raised back up and set in charge of all of Pharaoh's uh, goods and his business. And his brothers come begging for food. You remember that story? And then his brothers, when it's finally realized that that's our brother that we sold into slavery, and, and they're just, I, I think they were af afraid of their lives. But Joseph grasped the situation and he said, you intended it for bad, but God intended it for good. Look at this, Genesis 50, 20. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. So what about you? What kind of, what kind of person are you? Are you the type of person that only counts your disappointments? Or are you the type of person that counts your blessings? It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of attitude. Look at the next one. Look at verse 15. Philippians 1.15. Paul writes, It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. And so Paul understands this, and, and I'm sure that people have come to him and kind of tattletailed on what was going on in Rome while Paul's finding himself in, on house arrest. You see, when Paul is, is removed from preaching, there's now incentive for other people to begin to preach. And two groups emerge from this opportunity. The first group is the group that genuinely love Paul, and they recognize that, 
that Paul would want that work continued and, and they didn't want the work to suffer. And so before it loses any progress, they step into that gap and they picked up the torch and they carried it honorably. And they begin to preach the risen Jesus with the same passion that Paul had. And they, they did it with the same sacrificial love that Paul had. But there's a second group that also emerges. And that's that group that was only preaching because it benefited them personally. Here's what I want you to see out of this. It's number two on your sheet. When Christ is sinner, He delivers us from our preoccupation with how other people view us. You see, Paul's imprisonment had left a power vacuum there. And, and, and when a dominant leader is removed from the scene, other people begin to fill that power vacuum. And, and, and they jockey for position and they jockey for power. And in this case, Paul removes him, is removed from preaching and other people begin to step into that role. And, and so he's been so successful in everything that he's done there's a, there's a contingency of people that just want to piggyback on top of that. And they just want to do it just because they can earn a buck. But there's, and, and there's some there that, that are just preaching because they're jealous of Paul and they're rivals of Paul. And, and, and so they take the opportunity to make a name for themselves. They want to build their own reputations, if you will. So you can imagine everything that's being said about Paul at this moment. All of these people that, that are doing it, trying to make a name for themselves, I, I think everybody understands this situation, don't you? That when, when you have the top guy go down, everybody piles on. Everybody takes the opportunity to make him look bad, or they'll say things to make themselves look good, and, and somehow just kind of begin to knock down, keep the, keep the top guy down. You see, they want that position, they want that power, they want that whatever for themselves. You see, they're not preaching out of love for others. They're preaching for themselves. They're preaching not because they're passionate about the good news, but because they're passionate about self-promotion. And You can imagine what, how, what Paul thought of this when people come to him and would say, so-and-so's preaching and here's the reason why he's doing it. He's charging people or... Or here's what they've said about you. Paul's response, I, I, my response, I mean, I would try to protect my name. I would try to protect my position. I would have tried to protect my, my ministry. And so I, I, sometimes we, we do that and we seek vengeance or try to send out our own little minions to try, to try to keep ourselves bolstered up. Some people just fall into depression, fall into sadness and downtroddenness. They spiral into, into depression because they're, everything they've worked so hard for is being stolen right out from underneath their noses. That's not Paul's attitude, though. Paul, his, Paul's attitude reveals where his priority lies. You see, the motives of the other people don't phase Paul in the least. He doesn't care why they're preaching. He doesn't care who gets the credit. He doesn't care what other people are saying about him. He doesn't care about how people have criticized him or how people have been unfriendly to him or how people are trying to be better than him and try to outdo him. Here's what Paul says. Is Christ being preached? Well, yeah. And then Paul says that's all that matters. I'm not, Paul's going, I'm not concerned about what other people say about me. I'm not concerned about losing in any influence that I have over people. You see, God can take those negatives and use them for good. Paul had seen him advance the kingdom through, through bad circumstances. Even when somebody does something out of evil motives, God can do great things through that. But by focusing on what other people are saying about us and, and how other people are trying to knock us down or hold us down, when we focus on that from other people, we become cranky, we become petty, we become defensive and overly sensitive. But for Paul, here's what's central to him, Christ. And because Christ is central, the advancement of the gospel is the ultimate. That's all he cares about. His own future, his own well-being is set aside. 
He's willing to sacrifice his reputation and his notoriety for the name of Christ. Number three, look at verse 19. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. So number three, when Christ the sinner, He calms our fears about ourselves and our future. You, Paul, do you know why Paul's in prison here? Paul's in prison for one thing, his devotion to Christ. That is the only reason he's in prison. And his zeal to spread the gospel. He, he decided to appeal to Caesar. So you can imagine just how disheartened he became. And how, how despondent and how negative he could have become. He could have, in his mind, I don't know how he kept from doing this. But I would have said, God, after everything I've given up for you, this is how I'm repaid. I've put it all on the line and then you have me shackled to a guard. So Paul could have become depressed and discouraged and dis disillusioned, but he doesn't respond that way. Instead of responding with negativity and self-pity, Paul regards his current condition as an appointment by God. You see, he, he believes in his mind that God's plan is a plan that would ultimately fulfill a greater purpose. Paul refuses to be crippled by other people's words and motives. He doesn't take things personally. He accepts where he is and what's happening with an open heart and an open mind. He just says, I know this will lead to my deliverance. This will all turn out for my deliverance. I think about you and I when we endure sufferings and hardships and tough situations like this in our own life. A lot of times we have difficulty accepting that station in life, don't we? We don't want to come to terms with it and, and, and just adopt it and move on. Do you resent where God has you today? Think about your job or your marriage or your position with your kids or your position in the community. Do you resent God because where you're at? Do you gripe and complain? Have you tried to establish blame or make excuses and point fingers? And, or do you already, or do you take a step back and just begin to Take inventory of the blessings that you've been given. Do you honestly think you can respond or react or live in a way that He receives glory? You know, whether it's in prison here, sometimes it just feels like it's prison, don't it? But, but whether it's a prison or some other life situation, God wants you to serve Him faithfully and joyfully. You see, God is pleased with Paul's attitude here. You know, any other response other than joyful submission to where God has placed you with, what he, with, with certain gifts, talents, and abilities, any other response is almost like you're bowing up at God and saying, God, I don't like where you've put me, and, and, and I think I could do a better job of making my own plans. It's arrogance. But for Paul, Christ was the sinner. And so he doesn't contest God's decisions. He doesn't worry about what's next. He believes that whatever comes into his life is all part of God's plan. And God loves me, and God had placed me here for a particular reason, and God will eventually deliver me. In, in Paul's life, God's plan trumps everything. And he submits to it. And so he's so captivated by Christ. Christ is so central to him in everything in his life. Paul, the very basics here, 
He's not concerned with his circumstances. His position of authority or even his personal well-being because Paul has a gospel-centered heart. And so for Paul, he's consumed with one thing, the advancement of the gospel, making Christ known, giving God glory. And so by keeping God the central focus in his life, Paul is given great joy. Even in the midst of these circumstances, it's not turned out how he wanted. Paul is full of joy. He's, he, he, he has this ability to see the, the impact his imprisonment is having on the guards and, and the Roman court officials and other Christians and, and that they're being emboldened in their personal faith. And more and more people are preaching the gospel. He sees that. I can honestly say, if I would have been in Paul's shoes, I would have never have saw those things. They would have, hidden, they would have remained hidden behind my own blackness and despair. And I think most of us never would have under, arrived at that level of understanding. However, Paul has Christ as his full fo focus. And when that's true, you begin to see things in a little bit different light. You know, having Christ central in your life begins to bring a little, a little bit of clarity to all the chaos. And you can, you can realize that there's good working in the midst of the bad. And our own personal comfort takes a back seat to God's plan and God's purpose. And it's just like all of a sudden we can see it with such clarity when Christ is central. And that's where Paul finds himself as he's on house arrest. And that's what Paul has written in this passage. And so I want to encourage you to take this and realize the power of Christ being central in your life has an immense impact and can influence and can do great good in our lives. Let's pray. Father, I'll be first to admit, Lord, that I have a tendency to look at my circumstances, my situation, the things that have happened to me. Lord, I have a tendency to look at what's going on in our world. And I see the glass is half full. And I make excuses and I point blame. And Lord, I, I don't want to accept what's going on. But Lord, may my attitude evolve to that of Paul's. Lord, I, I, I want an attitude more like this. I want an attitude that, uh, that accepts where you've placed me and what you've given me. Lord, and I look at, at the, the possibilities of the advancement of the gospel in the midst of those hardships. Lord, and I know that as we do that, that attitude is infectious amongst other believers. It emboldens other believers. And the gospel is strengthened and it moves forward and it advances at a rapid pace. Father, we're thankful for all of the things that you've allowed to pass through your hands, good and bad. Because even in the bad, you can use it for good. We give you praise, glory, and honor for all that allowed to pass through your fingers and into our lives. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more content like this, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure to click the little bell to be notified every time we upload a new video. You see, our goal here at Arnhart is to make biblical, God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless if they're able to be in person with us or not. If you'd like to join us live, go over to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Arnhart Baptist Church and join us for service Sundays at 1045 a.m. If you'd like more information about our church, visit our website at arnhart.org. As always, we love you and hope to see you next week.